I'm here with Dr. Kyle Gillette, and this is gonna be your overall guide to peptides across all kinds of different categories. So Dr. Kyle, what do we got here? What different categories of peptides? Yeah, so I like to think of peptides instead of, this is a medication, this is a peptide, this is a supplement. I like to think of them in their class. So a good example with medications is GLP-1s like semaglutide or liraglutide. That's actually a peptide class as we'll see over here as well. Those are your GLP-1 receptor agonists, which we've talked about before. But there's other classes of peptides. For example, in your GHRPs, that's where you have things like uh, ibutamorin, that's where you have tesamorlin, which is a grifta. You also have your VEGF peptides like BPC, and we'll go into each category in more depth soon. You also have growth agonists like TB500, GHK copper peptide. You have your melanocordin receptor agonist or melanotans. There's four different ones of those, which we'll talk about as well. And you have your amylin, and we could probably throw insulin in there as well. Of course, there's other categories of peptides, but these are the general overarching groups that I think of that helps me keep them separate. I wanna mention, I popped a 30% off discount link down below for Thrive Market. Now, Thrive Market is an online grocery store, but it's not like a regular grocery store. It's set up by different diet categories. Okay, so you've got keto, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got different diet categories. So it allows you to get the best quality foods, Okay, no preservatives, no garbage. You can stock up your whole house, not just your pantry. They have sustainable meat and seafood options, so you can stock up your fridge. They're working on really cool options as well. So you're looking at just everything you can get in a store, essentially, that's gonna be in frozen or in the regular section, delivered to your doorstep. And with this link, you save 30% off your entire first grocery order plus a free $50 gift. So I've also created my fasting bundle, which is things that I recommend people get for breaking their fast and also for sustaining their eating period with the right kind of foods. So that link is in the top line of the description right below this video. I definitely recommend you check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, but they have been for like five or six years now. And it is definitely where you want to be going as pretty much your one-stop shop almost entirely your one-stop shop for what you can get delivered to your doorstep for your intermittent fasting routine. Now, people will ask me a lot of times, be like, well, uh, what pe peptides are, are good for me? And I guess that's the thing that gets a little bit, a lot more nuanced because that's just the thing with peptides is peptides aren't, it's not like you have mentioned before in other videos, not like just taking, you know, overarching growth hormone. Like there's yeah. a lot of specificity with peptides, which means that, you know, it's, one for one person is not gonna be as good for another person. And that's what also makes them interesting. So, so what's this first category, these uh, GHRPs, what are these? So GHRPs are growth hormone releasing peptides. You have two main categories. So one is you have your ghrelin agonist. So um, ghrelin, a lot of people are familiar with, it makes you hungry, it can make you a little bit anxious, um, but uh, ghrelin's released and in general, when you're hungry and not when you're not hungry. That's one of the reasons why when you fast, you tend to ha release more ghrelin. Ghrelin binds a G-protein coupled receptor in the pituitary, and that helps the body release more growth hormone, pulsatilely. So it is a growth hormone releasing peptide. In fact, we discovered ghrelin because we knew that these gr the ghrelin agonists like ipomorelin or ibutamorin would bind that receptor in the pituitary. And we looked for what the endogenous equivalent of that was, and it happens to be ghrelin. Interesting. So, so what does this look like in the human body if someone's taking a GHRP that acts upon ghrelin? What is it, uh, what's the mechanism or what's the, the use case? The use case is um, things like borderline growth hormone deficiency or growth hormone deficiency. Um, there's also use cases in things like lipodystrophy. You have huge amounts of abdominal body fat, um, visceral abdominal body fat, and um, you want to decrease the amount of that body fat. A lot of times ghrelin agonists are used to potentiate the effect of a growth hormone release, releasing hormone analog. So the other category of GHRP is GHRH analog. So if you use a low dose of a ghrelin agonist and a low dose of a GHRH analog, then theoretically you'd have um, slightly more of the benefit, a synergistic one plus one equals three response. You could use much lower doses of both and you won't have as many of the side effects that you get with either one. For example, 
ghrelin um, analogs like Loom 201 slash ibutamorin, also known as MK677. Um, these theoretically can make you slightly anxious and can also make you hungrier than normal. So these have less of that side effect, but you, if you, at some point you're overloading the receptor. Both of these work on a different receptor in the pituitary. So with both of them, you do see at a high enough dose, a response that increases both growth hormone and IGF-1, and usually also IGF-BP3. Interesting. So examples of GHRH analogs, Agrifta is one of those, which is Tessamorlin. CJC is one of these. I believe it's 1295. Um, Let's see, sermorlin is another one. Sermorlin, and then uh, sarcotropin is another one. There's a whole bunch of GHRH analogs and a whole bunch of ghrelin agonists as well. But in general, my go-to is tessamorlin, occasionally sermorlin. sermorlin has been around the longest and it was one of the first to go through uh, this different stages of uh, clinical trials but now is used less just because tessamorlin has recently gotten FDA approval, I believe for three different indications. Interesting. So, so someone, uh, you know, with GHRH, uh, GHRH, these are the ones that people are looking a little bit more towards, uh, what specific muscle related kind of growth hormone response. Like what, what's the use case for these specifically? Very similar to these. So lipodystrophy and, um, growth hormone deficiency. Gotcha. Now, when you're looking at, you know, growth hormone deficiency, that's going to be something where, um, Typically, someone that's an older person, that's maybe they're not producing as much, or you see it in younger people as well. You can see it in either age. And in fact, many of these have been studied for indications of pediatric growth hormone deficiency. But there's a, as you're alluding to, there's a relativistic change in what is, a, what is the Goldilocks zone or what's allowable for an older age and what's allowable for a younger age. You don't want an individual who's 19 years old to have an IGF-1 of 70. However, in someone who's 80 years old, you're probably okay with that. Um, in someone who is, uh, you know, 40, it would be in between. So my general rule of thumb is an IGF-1 between about 100 and 250 is the Goldilocks zone, not so high that you're at risk of tumor growth and hyperglycemia and insulin resistance, and not so low that you're at risk of sarcopenia and uh, increased adiposity, increased intramuscular triglyceride, et cetera. So if someone is, let's say they want to go to their doctor because they're interested in sort of the, uh, I don't know, uh, longevity aspect. When I say longevity, I just mean they want to feel youthful, sort of, a, you know, things like that. This category is that if someone were to say, hey, doctor, I want to go on, you know, HGH because I'm 50 years old and I want to start feeling younger. And, you know, doctor says, okay, HGH isn't the route. Is this the category that people would usually look at in that case? Often if they are borderline deficient in growth hormone or IGF-1, a better option is to go on a very low dose of both of these. Part of it depends on if they have a, a relative contraindication. Um, contraindications in my mind would be um, active tumor, benign or malignant, chance of an active tumor, benign or malignant. So they'd want to have aggressive preventive screening, both with diagnostic imaging and advanced uh, like early cancer detection, and also risk of hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. There's actually um, clinical, clinical literature published that shows cases of GHRP-induced diabetes reversible when you stop the GHRP. Hmm. Specifically, I believe with ibutamorin, which is MK677, uh, I call it GHRP diabetes, and it is almost identical to gestational diabetes. Because if you think about gestational diabetes, which is when a uh, pregnant lady uh, get, does a glucose tolerance test and would normally be diagnosed with diabetes, but it, it's because of something called HPL, which is human placental lactogen. It's very similar, it's very analogous to growth hormone itself, and uh, it would be similar to giving someone growth hormone or a GHRP. So it's reversible when you stop that. Interesting. Is it very interesting? Does it work along the same pathway that, I mean, could it also be indirect that maybe they're just eating more? <laughs> <laughs> that, that could also be. Uh, however, even independent of eating more, we know that you do have transient 
acute hyperglycemia. So if you follow it along with your CGM, then uh, it's not unusual to see uh, glucose higher throughout the day. Gotcha. Okay. So then, all right. So if you've got a, a tumor, anything, uh, you know, benign or malignant, hopefully if you have a, you know, malignant tumor, you're taking care of that first anyway. Um, any other kinds of side effects or anything like that you notice within these categories outside of say like the actual risk with tumors themselves? Uh, anxiety can be one. Sleepiness, it can, it can cause you to sleep a lot. It can cause you to be anxious. But the main one is the increased glucose, as we mentioned. Um, of note, uh, most of these do not have good oral bioavailability. Some of them do come um, not in the, in the brand name, but they do come compounded in trochies that are buccally absorbed to skip uh, gut metabolism. But most of them are injected subcutaneously. Interesting. Okay, so we move into this, this next category. So we've got uh, you know, VEGF, with the vascular endothelial growth factor, which in very simple terms is uh, increasing vasculature, increasing you know, angiogenesis. But where does this come into play? Who is a candidate for this, sort of this category? Yeah, so uh, this is a little bit more simple. BPC-157 is the only peptide that I know that is angiogenic. It's a body protective compound and it's made in uh, higher levels endogenously by those with, that have healthy guts and stomachs. So VEGF is technically a cytokine. So you think uh, about what cytokines do if you have inflammation, if you have an injury in your shoulder, then um, your capillaries will become leaky. It'll leak plasma, just like platelet-rich plasma. And in your plasma, whether it's platelet-rich plasma that a doctor takes out in the vein, and we do this in my clinic too, but um, it's just way more convenient to prescribe BPC-157 with a similar benefit. And you don't have to go get your um, plasma drawn, spin down the red blood cells, and then inject the PRP. The same process happens naturally, and that's one of the reasons why there's less emphasis on ice for healing, is because if you ice down those capillaries, they'll constrict them, you won't leak out the plasma, you won't leak out the VEGF, and you won't um, have the multiple benefits, but the main benefit would be improved blood flow and blood vessels that are going to that area to help heal it. Is that why, I mean, literally why heat is promoted so much more than ice now? I mean, you're just trying to get more blood into the area and more, more VEGF? Yeah, the dose does make the poison. So if you have so much swelling that you literally can't stand the pain, then uh, you don't necessarily have to keep putting heat, keep putting heat on it. So in the acute phase, you manage the swelling and um, you balance it out to where you have enough to where you're delivering um, cytokines and plasma to the area to heal, but not so much to where you can't bear it. Got it, got it. Okay, so BPC-157, so that's something um, you can take literally at the actual site of injury. Correct. Occasionally it's prescribed in versions of capsules for individuals with things like Crohn's disease, but similar to GHRHs, really these first three categories, one of the major risks is gonna be tumor growth. Um, I often mention the medication Avastin, A-V-A-S-T-I-N, which uh, blocks VEGF. So it's the opposite of BPC-157, and it, it is a essential chemotherapy medication. So it's prescribed for many different types of cancers. Cancers tend to overexpress VEGF, and they tend to be well vascularized. So you don't want to send even more blood flow to something that's so hungry for blood flow that it's growing. Got it, got it. Okay, so any side effects outside of you know, tumor growth, anything like that, like no nausea, weird things like that? Not that I know of. Okay. So in this particular category, this uh, is something that we talked a little bit in another video about mm -hmm. frequency, dosing, things like that. What would you recommend if someone were to talk to their doctor about that? What's the proper strategy there? Yeah. So as you mentioned, talk to your doctor. And then if you're a candidate for it, just like if you're a candidate for PRP, then they would prescribe this to a pharmacy and the pharmacy would fill the medication for you. And they would train you, but most dosing regimens um, are subcutaneously administered. And it's usually two to three times a week for two to six weeks. And I have seen excellent results of this anecdotally, uh, as I've mentioned on the Gillette Health Podcast with my own experience using BPC-157 for my shoulder and also a tendon in my leg. But I've seen it with hundreds of patients as well. Um, but uh, inevitably, we will get comments on this video from people that say you're underdosing BPC-157, you need to use it continuously all the time, and that's just not the case. Got it. Now, asking for a friend, low back injuries, uh, disc issues, any anecdotal experience there? Yes, there is some experience. It, it's not 
quite the same precipitous effect that I see with various tendons in the shoulders, sometimes the meniscus, uh, sometimes tendons in the knee, but uh, I, have, I have had good luck with that as well. In general, I say if you try it and you don't notice anything in the first two to four weeks, it's just not going to work because I've also seen cases where it has not helped at all. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so nothing else in that VEGF category. Uh, now we move into the growth agonists, which uh, pretty self-explanatory term, but what compounds do we have in that list? Yeah, so here is TB500, which is uh, a piece of thymosin beta-4, okay. and then also GHK copper peptide. Thymosin beta-4 comes from the thymus, GHK copper peptide comes from the liver. They're one reason why, um, say, young children with a, a thymus and a very well-functioning liver can heal very quickly, whereas older individuals that do not have a thymus and do not have a well-functioning liver cannot. So I think of these as more targeted with similar benefits but with less risk than the shotgun approach of increasing growth hormone everywhere. About 30 years ago, the medical community went through a phase of, um, they thought growth hormone is the, um, you know, the answer, the de facto anti-aging molecule, although it literally does accelerate cell aging and cell turnover. So it's actually kind of an, a pro-aging molecule. But anyway, um, it's a strategy to get some of the benefits from here without all the risks. Got it. So we'll have. HKCU. Um, that is indeed copper. So let's say you've had bariatric surgery and you're not able to absorb copper well. About 10 years after gastric bypass um, or biliary pancreatic diversion, it's very common to see deficient copper levels. That's why any board certified obesity medicine physician or bariatrician will check a copper level. So that's another thing to watch out for, another fringe benefit. Um, or if you have anemia, low white blood cells or low red blood cells, but you do not have um, a deficient B12, folate, or iron, copper is probably another thing you want to check. It can cause bicytopenia. Another one's TB500. And I think that really mostly sums up that category. Okay. A lot of times it's used in partner with BPC157. Got it. So as far as uh I mean, again, like injury recovery, things like that, TB500 has a place there. You know, I know a lot of people talk about using this continuously as well, uh, sort of off-label in a way, I guess. Would that be the same category here where you would advise not doing that, doing it in shorter stints? Yeah, I would advise shorter stints. I know that the uh, thymus-related peptides have been used for other indications as well, like immunity. And anecdotally, I have not seen, seen good success with that. So other ones like thymosine alpha-1? Yeah. Okay, and that's one that's typically given, like what, it's like kind of a bolus of the immune system, right? Correct. So, and just not good data on it, or it's just? Not great data, and the risk-benefit profile isn't really there. When it comes to the scale, I often talk about the scale. You have your benefits on one side and your detriments on the other side. And when you have, uh, it, it's almost like, uh, it's, it's the benefits are flashing off and on because a lot of these have been through stage two or stage three clinical trials. And on the Gillette Health podcast, we've broke down most of these peptides. For example, we broke down how far did CJC make it in clinical trials. Its clinical trial in Brazil was stopped because there was a death with CJC, although a lot of practitioners still prefer CJC. I just don't prefer it myself. And I explain the reasoning if people want to see very in-depth explanations of the clinical literature then I've done those before. But when it comes to um, the, uh, I guess, long-term use of uh, these growth agonists, my main concern would be tumor growth. Um, I just feel like there's not enough of a, um, and by the way, BPC-157, GHK copper peptide, and TB-500 are always used off-label. There is no approved indication. Whereas for a lot of these classes, in fact, um, approved on-label indications, yes, 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 but these two do not. However, theoretically, they're some of the lowest risk. So whenever there's not an approved indication and it hasn't been through all three stages of clinical trials and gotten approved, then you want the theoretical risks to be as low as possible. And you also want to be familiar with um, how it's been used in the past. Interesting. Okay, so just kind of a quick summary on this one. So who is the best candidate for this? Is it gonna be any age group, any person that's just 
has an injury or is there an application for general recovery as well? We're just like feeling like, hey, general aches and pains, sort of like I don't recover fast. I feel like I hurt all the time. General recovery would be a secondary benefit, like a, a positive side effect, okay. if you will. Um, whereas the best candidate is someone who would otherwise need a different form of intervention or who wants to get back and let's say their profession depends on their performance. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, I do believe BPC-157, I don't know if it was WADA or USADA, but I believe it's on one of those two lists as of within the last year. Yeah. Um, so with all those other caveats, talk to your own doctor about whether or not you can use it or whether you should use it but uh, those individuals are the best candidates. Got it, got it. Okay, perfect. Well, why don't you and I do a do, -si -do. You come on this side if we're gonna start talking about the melanocortins. Right. That way, all right. So these are also known as the melanotans. And I actually like talking about these a lot because their approved indications are all over. Uh, so there's melanotan, we'll just abbreviate that MT, MT1 and MT2. These were studied, I think there was a professor out of Arizona that studied these, but Anyway, now there is an MT3 that is known as brimelanotide. Melanotide. And the other name for that is Vilisi. There's also MT4, which is set melanotide. And this one your is. Doc, your doctor's coming out with your. <laughs> so. You're writing there. Brimelanotide. This one. Uh, also known as Vilesi is indicated for hypoactive sexual disorder, whatever that is. So that's obviously a very <laughs> relative thing. Hypoactive, not Hypo hyperactive. Hypoactive sexual disorder. And oddly enough, um, it's only indicated in females, although for sure it works in both females and males. The, there's something called the limbic system. So limbic, I'll try to write a little bit larger. And here you have the hypothalamus, you also have the amygdala, and you also have uh, the hippocampus. But within the limbic system, there's a lot of different, what I call positive switches. So in order to have libido, you have to have all these switches on. And in fact, in order to go through puberty, you have to have all these switches on. Leptin is one of the switches. So leptin is one of the reasons why when, when you're very lean, um, you might have less, but AMSH is another one. Alpha, it should be a lowercase alpha because it's a Greek alpha, MSH. And this is what normally binds melanocortin receptors. And this is one of the reasons I know that uh, our friend Andrew Huberman often talks about how sunlight is going to increase libido when um, the Brazilians go out in their hottest time of the year, they start to go out to the beach, they have increased sexual activity. And um, these melanocortin receptors are part of it. You have sun exposure to the skin, and this is the endogenous version of this peptide is released, and you have increased libido. Um, and you also have more spontaneous erections. So this is often used. The other name for Sounds this kind is, of scary. is PT141. I, they have three names for everything. Like over here, they have Loom201, Ibutamorin, MK677. They have PT141, Brimelanotide, Vilesi. They have to have at least three or four or five names. And SARMs is the same way. Um, but you just memorize all of them and then hopefully one is adopted. Um, but with the PT141, it does um, stack nicely with other sexual health optimization measures. But as we mentioned, um, what is pathologic and what is not, there is a huge gray zone and it also depends on who your partner is. So uh, as an example, uh, as someone who's had two kids and I've also delivered a couple hundred babies, I'm familiar with how um, you might want to have a different sex drive when you're in, when your family's in the postpartum period versus when you're trying to get pregnant versus different times in your life. So that's something that you that everybody should talk to their doctor about. It's almost, it's kind of like the, what's the number normal of stools per day? For some people, three a day can be normal. So for some people, one every other day can be normal. Um, it sounds like that might be cheaper than therapy. <laughs> Yeah, but if you're considering therapy, on that note, as funny as that is, but... Um, <laughs> any, any side effects with that? You can that one sounds kind of, kind of interesting. Nausea is a side effect for all of these, and in fact, for all of these, becoming more tan. So a darker skin tone and loss of photo bleaching of the hair. So if you're uh, like a dirty blonde that has the photo bleaching effect, then often you lose that as you start to utilize any of these. Um, even the fourth generation, which is set melanotide, 
Um, that this is used in obesity medicine for genetic causes of, of obesity that have to do with leptin, that have to do with melanocortin receptor deficiencies, and something called Bardet Beetle syndrome, BBS. Um, but this does have uh, similar side effects and um, some, I guess you, you can have, it can be a positive side effect and it can be a negative side effect. But there's no down regulation? Like it doesn't, like you don't lose your libido if you come off of it? Correct, you, you don't. And these all have uh, fast half-lives. Yeah. So it's something that if someone, is, if someone is using it specifically for that reason and they're, you know, it's one of those things, being a ha fast half-life, it works quick or does it have to build up in your system still? It works very quickly. Notice right. it within minutes if it's all injectable. Right. Um, of note, some of these do come in lozenge, which we call trochies in medicine. So unlike these, these work okay oral? Or is it just um, within different categories of that? Usually they're, they're taken and they're absorbed in the buccal mucosa, which skips first pass. You don't have to go through the liver. They're just absorbed straight into the bloodstream, almost like a, a dip of nicotine. Uh, that's what we call trochies. And then yeah. lozenges, like a B12 lozenge, skips the metabolism the same way. So do all four of these have a similar effect on, on tanning? Or is it just, are these just newer iterations as time that's, has gone on? That's a great question because um, publicly I've talked about my concerns with the uh, melanocortin agonists being a uh, growth of things that respond to um, more alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. So theoretically, I suppose it could grow a melanoma, but I've talked with the, um, with the scientists, which we call medical science liaisons, MSLs. Um, I've spoken with uh, various people that represent the companies that make the brand names of these medications, and they have not had any reported cases of melanoma in any stage of their clinical trial or in any trial. Now, maybe there just hasn't been someone that has come along and gotten it, but um, according to, I guess, the clinical literature, it does not grow melanomas, but I am still concerned for that. So if you have any family history of melanoma, or if you have a dermatotype, um, for example, red hair and a lot of freckles and pale skin, significantly increased risk of melanoma, or if you've just had a, really, a lot of really bad sunburns, let's say you've had 10 um, severe sunburns throughout your life, you're also at increased risk of melanoma, then I consider that a contraindication for melanocortin receptor agonists. Interesting, okay, no, that's fair enough. Okay, moving on down the line, we've got amylins. So uh, what's this category all about? Yeah, so amylin is another peptide that's made by the pancreas. That's specifically the beta cell. So in your pancreas, you have your alpha cell and you have your beta cell. These are your endocrine cells of the pancreas and your islets of Langerhans. And none of that really matters that much, but the takeaway from this is it's indicated in diabetes, including type one diabetes, and it is very weight negative. So you think about insulin, which as I like to say is my favorite peptide because it's life-saving. Insulin is a bioidentical peptide. Um, well, not all insulins, but human insulin <laughs> is. Um, but anyway, um, amylin is the other thing that's made by the beta cell that has not really been replaced. We've tried a lot, so pramlinotide is one of them. Different marker. Just, yeah. That one's dying. Similin is the other name. So synthetic amylin is similin or pramlinotide. Linitide. So this one has a very short half-life and it's injected three times a day. And we even played around, people are familiar with insulin pumps. They also tried to put this in an equal ratio with an insulin pump. Because let's say you have type 1 diabetes, you have an autoantibody, you've destroyed all your beta cells. You can essentially make exogenous beta cells in artificial pancreas. And artificial pancreases are coming, by the way. But you can make a version of an artificial pancreas where you have a pump that releases both insulin and amylin in the same ratio. That way type 1 diabetics that take a lot of insulin don't tend to gain so much weight. So amylin is a potentiator when it comes to insulin. It's going to lower blood glucose and it's going to cause weight loss, which is why there's companies like Eli Lilly and others that are studying um, a next generation. You have what's called long-acting amylin. Long-acting. So these you inject once a week, long-acting amylin analogs, and you use them with GLP-1s. So um, this compared to this, 
this, you're not gonna have good adherence. Three times a day injections for someone that's not, uh, if, you, if you're a type one diabetic, then perhaps you have good adherence because your life depends on it. Um, but really your life more depends on the insulin. Uh, but if you're someone that has uh, insulin resistance and beta cell death, which one way to know that is your ratio of pro-insulin to insulin. If your pro-insulin is high, even if you do not have type one diabetes, if you have type 1.5 or if you have type two diabetes, or if you just have really severe insulin resistance, if your pro insulin's high and your insulin is relatively low compared to that, even if it's also high, then that is a sign of impending pancreatic death. So if your insulin is relatively low, then you can use an amylin analog and it will greatly decrease your use of insulin. So the best clinical use in this scenario is a diabetic of any type that their beta cells are gonna die anyway. They have no chance of getting off insulin unless they have some amylin to help re-insulin sensitize them. They're a great candidate for it. Interesting, okay, and these work well with GLPs, which I know a lot of people are familiar with, but maybe there's some other outside of just uh, the basic ones we've talked about before. Yep, semaglutide is kind of the main one. There's a combined GLP-GIP that is terzepatide. Terzepatide, that's Munjaro. And then there's liraglutide, which I like a lot. That is going to be generic soon, liraglutide. And there's several others. There's even a triple agonist. So we talked about in Cretans before. Um, there is a, a triple agonist that's not just GLP-1, not just GIP. And I don't think it's DPP-4. It's a different in Cretan effect. Um, but there's a lot more of these that are more and more powerful. We'll see an, an arms race of, race of, of escalation. However, whether or not they're necessary in the average individual that has obesity and a touch of metabolic syndrome, they're probably not necessary. What's necessary is addressing other mechanisms or other vectors of why they um, are obese, mostly lifestyle. Yeah. For the average, for, I'd say for 98% of people that don't have diabetes, you do not need anything more powerful than semaglutide to help your lifestyle interventions work. And for a lot of individuals that are obese, they don't even need semaglutide. In fact, they do better without it because it's harder to learn the habits that cement a good diet, exercise, and sleep practices in when you're covering that up with semaglutide. So when I do prescribe GLP-1s, often I do at one-fifth the maximum dose or even one-tenth the maximum dose so it's much easier to get off. Got it. It's like training wheels. You don't want to have your training wheel stabilize your bike too much. You'll never learn how to ride it yourself. That makes perfect sense. All right, before we, we wrap up on this, let's do a quick touch on, on SARMs for just a minute, because I know that's a common category, especially on YouTube, people talk about them all the time. Um, so what do, what does SARM stand for? What are they? And I know you mentioned that some of them are actually uh, getting through approval now. Yeah, so SARM stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modifiers. Um, most people are familiar with SERMs, which is selective estrogen receptor modifiers, and there's both um, natural compounds and also medications that do these things. Um, in fact, there's a couple uh, things that I'm looking at. Cystantia is one of them that's probably a natural SARM. We just don't know which tissues it's active in, which is kind of terrifying. Yeah. Um, so you sh if you're terrified of SARMs, then you should be. However, um, Osterine, which is MK2866, um, continually progresses forward in the clinical literature when it comes to what's called androgen receptor responsive breast cancer, which is actually extremely rare. It's usually triple negative. So ER negative, PR negative, HER2 HER2 new negative. Um, but you think about the benefits of that in an individual who has breast cancer, prostate cancer would be the other potential indication. And I've talked to a few um, oncologists that uh, deal with a lot of prostate cancer because the latest trend in um, breast cancer and prostate cancer in general is immunotherapy, but past that, more aggressive hormonal therapies have come into vogue with prostate cancer basically inhibiting the adrenal steroidogenesis cascade because they can block the um, cascade from the testes relatively easily, but you also want to block the adrenals. And SARMs do a couple things. One is that they do slightly suppress uh, hypothalamic and pituitary 
gonadotropic output. So think of LH in that case. They do slightly suppress it, but mostly they're going to increase the metabolism of testosterone and anything that's related to SHBG because you have a very low SHBG. It's not unusual to see an SHBG, uh, especially with ligandrol, which is LGD, or RAD140. It's not unusual to see an SHBG of three or even two. And when you have that low of an SHBG, you're basically going to have no regulation in the metabolism of your estrogens and your androgens. Yes, they do bind other proteins. Um, most hormones bind albumin, but just very weakly. But when that is the case, your HDL will go very low. Um, HDL, a lot of it's related to, it, it can be maintained higher with higher free estrogens. And if you have higher free androgens, it can go lower. The lower your SHBG, you're gonna have a relatively higher free androgens compared to free estrogens. And then also if your SARM happens to bind the androgen receptor in the liver itself, that's the mechanism of why it decreases SHBG. Got it. However, if you think about the benefits of these, it's kind of similar to oxandrolone or mastrone or a lot of the old school androgens that help with muscle wasting disease, including muscle wasting in cancer. And they might end up being a good option. And I think we'll know within the next couple of years, you'll see a potential indication for MK2866. They've now named it Enobosarm. Um, for triple negative androgen receptor responsive breast cancers and potentially even prostate cancer. Okay, so then what are the, uh, like any down regulation, any suppression that happens with those? I think that's when people look at SARMs like, oh great, they're safe, I don't have any shutdown, anything like that, you know, especially guys that are looking at them maybe on the black market, they're, being, they're like, hey, look, at, there's no shutdown. Um, there it is. sounds like there is some. Yeah, there is some, it's, it's not going to be as significant as some other things. For example, I've even heard people say, there's no shutdown with oxandrolone, which is Anivar. Yeah. And yes, um, that also causes hypothalamic and pituitary suppression, which is shutdown. So it's not something that you should take, but it's something that you could be excited about it. I'm excited about it given my family history of prostate cancer, prostate pathologies at young ages. Um, I hope that if at one point when I'm older, I got prostate cancer, that these are my best chance to maintain quality of life, to maintain a low body fat percentage, to maintain a decent athletic performance and a decent health span, even if I actively have uh, prostate cancer or even metastatic prostate cancer. That's very interesting, man. Okay, this has been a very, very good summary, man. So wh where can everyone find you? My main hub is on Instagram, Kyle Gillette MD, and everywhere else, Gillette Health. We do have a YouTube channel. So if you check that out, I'd appreciate it. Right on. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Thanks, man.